Let me read to you from uh, John chapter 12 this morning. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Read along with me. It'll be great. John 12, 12 through 19. Verse 12 starts this way. The next day. Of course, that means we need to know what happened previously which we went into last week, where Jesus was with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha at their house. So the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. That is a a great statement, isn't it? They were so jealous. But here we've got Jesus again. He has set his face directly, firmly, towards Jerusalem. That's where he's going. He's on his way. The greatest sequence of events ever to take place in the history of the world were about to happen. Over the past three years or so, Jesus had gone from being an unknown from Nazareth to being renowned, loved, and hated far and wide. (coughs) He had touched so many lives, healed the sick, raised the dead, and declared himself to be the Son of God and the Son of Man. He taught about the kingdom of God. Whose kingdom is it? His kingdom. He taught about the kingdom of God, which is his kingdom. He called the people to repent of their sin. That was the very first thing he preached, if you remember, after his uh, temptation in the wilderness. He came out, he stood in the open, and he cried out, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was his message. Sad how much the gospel message has changed these days across this world. Many, many, many places, churches, so-called, don't even use the word repent. They won't preach repentance. They may mention the fact that we have, you know, messed up a little bit. But they won't preach repentance. And yet Jesus, the Son of God, who came in the form of man, stands in the very center of all of them and calls them to repent. That's the message. We ought not to forget that. He calls them to repent, to believe upon him and to be saved. That was his message again. He is the Messiah promised to come from the seed of Eve. He is the one whose heel would be bruised and whose heel would ultimately crush the head of that age-old serpent, the devil. How many of us here believe that the head of the serpent is crushed? It is. He may not be in the lake of fire as of yet. The promise is that he will be. If you've read Revelation, you'll know Satan and all of his hordes are cast into the lake of fire. That's the outcome he has to look forward to. It's going to happen. But even now, his head is crushed. When was it crushed? On the cross. That's when he was bound, no longer able to deceive the nations. His head is crushed, friends, and we need to know it and we need to believe it. When Jesus spoke, people were gripped 
How many times have you read that they marveled at his wisdom? They, they, couldn't, they couldn't grasp the, the glory, the beauty. I mean, we were talking about Whitfield the other day, I think, and how, uh, how he spoke, how he was so eloquent, and how his voice seemed to reach thousands of people. There was nothing compared to Jesus. He was so, so eloquent. His voice, I'd never heard his actual voice. Not with my ears, with a heart. But he was so eloquent. He, he spoke so, so plainly, but so clearly, so beautifully. They marveled at his wisdom. And this wisdom was far superior than even the most learned of the Pharisees. And these Pharisees had spent their time, their years, locked away in the scriptures, learning the law, uh, all 600 and 13 or whatever it is of the laws that they have. And that's why they have so many tassels around their robes and on their arms or wherever they are on this stuff they wear because it represents every one of the laws. But he, he himself had had no real formal training. He hadn't gone through the rabbinical schools. He wouldn't have been accepted. And yet he spoke with such authority such authority that there's not only this intellectual ability to produce and to speak about facts and figures, if you like, but he had such understanding, more than the scribes had, such a power in his speech and in his actions and even in his very presence that none had ever witnessed before. This is the Lord. Some were confused as to who he was. Others thought he was a blasphemer. They thought he was a pretender. A clever man, but a liar and a usurper of authority. Some even said that he had a demon. Well, that's blasphemy, isn't it? They called him a blasphemer. And yet they were blaspheming themselves. And we see this around today. All people are, yes, you know, even the Muslims, they will say, oh, we, we, we love Jesus. He's a great prophet. But he's not the son of God. How many of us in this day and age, or how many people in this day and age still have the same attitude of trying to prove Jesus to be everything that he isn't? They say he isn't the son of God. Even those pretenders of Christianity like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, they deny his deity. They are not Christians, no matter what they tell you. But here we're told in these scriptures that many believed in him. Countless, numberless lives were affected, transformed. Many were saved. And these people now tread the halls of glory. The hearts of these people were regenerated, made new. They became new creations. They were free from sin and the bondage that it brought to them. Chains were smashed and broken hearts were bound up. Hard hearts were shattered and those hearts of flesh promised in Ezekiel replaced them. And a love a love that cannot be outshone, a mercy that cannot be matched, and grace that cannot be bought was magnified in the once most vile of sinners. So changed were these that many would lay down their lives willingly because they were unwilling to deny their master who brought them. And they went to their demise joyfully, even singing to their Lord. What a picture that is. So this man, taking upon himself the sin of all his people, weighed down and troubled by it, on his journey to the city of Jerusalem where he would be arrested, where he would be beaten, where he would be tortured and killed on a Roman cross, which was, well, an awful torture. He stopped there to visit his friends, this is what we saw last week, to comfort them, to encourage them, 
to show them his love and bid them farewell. Now, there are people in this world, no doubt, who have and, and do show their great concern for others, even at the expense of their own welfare. But none such as this one. None such as he who came from the glories of heaven. We don't know the depths of the riches of the glories of heaven. We've not been there. But he has. That's where he came from. He descended. He had that glory as he talks about. You remember in John 17 where he, he's in his high priestly prayer and he says, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before. And he had all that glory. He was with his Father, he was with the Spirit, and then he condescends to lower himself, to take upon himself the form of his own creature, of his own creation. That is humility beyond our scope. And to allow himself one of such eternal magnificence and eternal majesty and glory to be abused by those whose very breath in their nostrils he had given. There is none such as he. Now the kings of this earth, they adorn themselves with splendor and pomp with riches, with high society, rubbing shoulders, with dignitaries, raising themselves on platforms. That's what we see. You know, they dress in, in royal robes. Maybe they have servants to cater to their every whim. But all of these human, royal standing, all these people pale insignificance to he who is the true example of what a king is and this king the true king there is no pomp no human riches what did it say about the son of God the saviour he had nowhere to lay his head wherever he slept was either outdoors or at the mercy and grace of his friends he had no home of his own He had no royal robes, apart from a nice cloak or tunic that he was given that the soldiers fought over at his death. He was a friend of sinners. He was a one who did not crave for the approval of man. And this king rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. So in this scripture, in this text that we've read, John informs his readers that the next day after Jesus was with Lazarus, with Mary and with Martha, that there was a great multitude that had heard that he was coming to Jerusalem for the feast. That they took for themselves palm branches and they went out to meet him. That's what we read. These people had come up to the feast. That's what the scriptures say. They came up to the feast. And so they, these themselves were not actually inhabitants of Jerusalem. But wherever they were from, this great multitude were ordinary common folk, perhaps from the country regions about. Maybe they were ones who had heard Jesus speak for themselves personally, or at least they'd heard all about him and had a great and a deep respect for him. It's always good, as I keep saying to you every week, week in, week out, to keep context in mind. So when you look back into John 11, verses 55 and 56, it tells us there that the Jews sought Jesus and discussed among themselves whether he would be coming to the feast or not. That's the context of where we are now. They were discussing among themselves, will he come? What, do you think he's going to come to the feast? Are we going to see him? Will he be there? Let's try and find him. With this in mind, we ought to note one or two things. Listen to the words of Moses to God's people in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. This is part of what is known as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Anyone accomplishing that? No, me neither. But you shall love the Lord your God like this. But it says this in verse 6, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, some of this was taken very literally by the Jews. They wore boxes, they strapped boxes to the front of their head with scriptures inside of them called a phylactery to basically literally fulfill this, having the word as a front but on their foreheads. Now, amongst other things, there's something very common which happens when the people of God get together. Psalm 1 says, the blessed man, he also is called the righteous man. He is the one who meditates on his law day and night. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the text quoted from Deuteronomy, the word is said to be in your heart. It should be in your heart where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of God shall be in your heart. People talk about what is most on their hearts. This is common to every single person. But what is common to every believer is that they love to talk about the Lord. They love to discuss his word with one another. Whenever and wherever those who love the Lord meet, it isn't long before they are deep into conversation about him. That's my experience. We were privileged to eat some fine lasagna not too long back at Miriam Mays. So nice it was that Demi had two portions, can you believe it? Demi had two portions of lasagna with meat in it. <coughs> But we, we were there perhaps from, I don't know, half four or something, and I don't know what time we left. I can't remember. It, it was dark, and it was time for the kids to go to bed. But the point is, those few hours were like a few minutes. We were talking, discussing questions, answers, debate. Not debate in a kind of backwards and forwards bad way, but to talking about the things of God, talking about the bookcase over there. What, what was it made from, did you say? The pews of the old church. Fantastic. Lovely bookcase. And I was looking at them, I was thinking, yeah, I've got that one, I've got, <laughs> I've got that one. And we started to talk about a few books. And the point I'm saying is this, that we get together with those of a like mind, and all of a sudden we're talking about the Lord, we're talking about the things of God, we're talking about people, we're talking about what he's done, what, he, what we hope he'll do, what we're praying for. Maybe some books that we've read, the people of the past, the people of the future, maybe. But there's that commonality that when people who love God get together, there is a natural sense in which you just fall into this discussion, this longing to talk about the Lord. Our interest in the Lord and his word is made manifest in every area of our lives. As it says in Deuteronomy, it should be manifest when we sit in our house. When we're going about all the ways of our daily lives. When we are at rest and when we get up to start the day again. As it says in Deuteronomy, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way. That's not just talking about when you decide to take the dog for a walk. It's talking about when you walk in the way of life, whatever it is that you do. When you lie down and when you rise up again. I was very challenged by the brothers and sisters in Nepal we were serving with. 
It didn't matter what time. It didn't matter where we went. Even a trip to the local kiosk to buy fruit. Every opportunity was taken to find someone to talk to about the Lord. Even when we were in the vehicles and we were traveling in some, I mean, amazingly rough terrain, where we, you know, literally our spines must have been jarred the whole way. Bumping, jumping around, bouncing around. Even on those roads, tracks were being handed through the windows of the car to pass us by who were carrying their things to their homes. You see, there's, there was no separation for them. No, there weren't no certain days or, or certain times for the Lord and church activities. Even, even walks out, family trips, etc. They were always ready and always active in finding someone to give the message of the gospel to. Amazing to see, very challenging to me. I was looking at them and thinking, wow, I need to go home and sort myself out a little bit here. They, they were eating, they were drinking, they were sleeping and living the gospel. Always looking for somebody who might listen to the message. Look again at this great multitude. The passages from John 11. They came up from the country to Jerusalem to purify themselves and make themselves ready for the Passover. Many of them would be strangers to each other. And yet they were told, we're told in the scriptures that they, they all sought Jesus and they all discussed him among themselves as they stood in the temple. See, they had a common interest. They were all excited, all wondering, really, who is this man? And they couldn't, he was the topic of conversation. They, they had nothing else that they wanted to talk about. But who is he? Where is he? Is he coming? Is he not coming? Will we see him? Will we hear him? They discussed among themselves about who he was. And their discussion was about whether he'd come to the feast. But look, look what happened when they heard that he was coming to Jerusalem. Their discussion then turned into action. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, this is the, this is the springboard. When they heard he was coming, they'd been discussing, they were seeking him, they were asking the questions, will he be here, won't he be here? But then they heard, I don't know how they heard, but they heard that he was coming. It had been confirmed. So when they heard, they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him. And there they cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. It appears to me that there is a message here for every believer. You see, some of the very last words of Jesus in the entire Bible are found in Revelation 22 12 and 13 says this. This is Jesus speaking. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Friends, as Christians... We are not waiting to hear if Jesus is coming. We're not sitting here discussing, wondering if Jesus is coming. We already know that he's coming, don't we? We already know that he is. We're not just sitting there discussing like they were, just having no idea. But we know, we talk about this, don't we? Jesus is coming again. He's coming for his people. He's going to collect them and gather all of his saints from the four corners of the world. And he's going to judge the quick and the dead. He is coming. We know this. Now, our salvation does not rest upon our own works. As Christians, we ought to know this. It rests upon the work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 emphasizes this. When it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, 
lest anyone should boast. Our salvation is not of our own working. It's not a wage that has been paid for our work. However, Paul does go on in verse 10 of that context there to make it clear that good works are a part of our active Christian lives and which he has prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. We are to work while it is day, for night is coming when no man can work. Those are the words of Jesus. We must work whilst the light is here, because darkness is coming. You won't be able to work then. We are to multiply those talents given to us while we await the return of the master. It's what these, these stories, these parables, I guess, are about. We're not to bury it like that last servant. He was given one and he was afraid and had some idea in his mind that the master was cruel and harsh. And so what did he do? He buried his talent so that he wouldn't lose it. But he didn't do anything with it. He didn't even put it in the bank for interest. He buried it. The manifestation, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's given to everyone, not some, not only some, but all. And it's for the profit of all. The body of Christ is named because it is one body under one head, Jesus Christ. But like a body, it is made up of individual parts, and these parts are different. Some are more prominent. Some, some are more modest. But all are given works to accomplish, and all are called to be a part of the great commission by which the gospel is preached. Disciples are made in every nation who are brought into Christ's church through baptism and are taught all the things that Christ commanded. Every Christian is to continue all their lives in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, and in prayer. And in Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51, in the context of Jesus coming again, Jesus speaks about both the faithful and the wicked servant. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, he says, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delayed in coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant, servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we know Jesus is coming. And as Christians, God has given us works to do. Not to earn salvation and not to earn his favour because we already have it and that's why we do them. But we want to be a wise servant, don't we? Not the wicked one that says, it's okay, he's not coming yet, we've got time. We need to work while it is day. So then, Jesus is here, he's entering Jerusalem and he arrives at Jerusalem and he's riding a young donkey. The multitude took palm branches and waved them, crying, Hosanna, as Jesus passed by. Now, there are at least, to me, three reasons why Jesus decided a donkey on which to enter Jerusalem. And I believe you can find these reasons in Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Firstly then, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies 
pointing directly to the Messiah. Now that's physically impossible unless he is the Messiah. To fulfill over, it's probably more like 350. To fulfill all of those prophecies of the Messiah. And this, this is what we've just read. This is one of them. Zechariah 9 verse 9. And so Jesus, as he entered into Jerusalem, he would have chosen a donkey in order to fulfill this prophecy and in so doing show his followers who would have known this, that he is indeed that Messiah, which which was prophesied about throughout the Old Testament. He proved it to them. He showed them, this is me. Secondly, this prophecy calls him a king. And then, as it says specifically, your king. Jesus entered Jerusalem with palm branches waved by the multitude. Palm branches were often used when welcoming a victorious king or a a victorious military leader when they were returning from battle in triumph. That's what it was about. This image is then a very fitting one for the Lord Jesus Christ as it reveals him to be a triumphant and victorious king. Note also that this multitude cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. The prophecy said, your king. And here they esteem him to be the king of Israel. He didn't force them to say that. They cried it out. You are the king of Israel. This prophecy said, behold, your king is coming. Now kings, they don't walk into their cities, do they? No. They ride in on a horse. Jesus, as king, also rode into the city of Jerusalem. He didn't walk in, not this time. He rode in. But why then, if kings rode on a horse, did Jesus ride in on a donkey? (coughs) This brings us to the third and particularly a telling reason. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings. There is no king like him, none so wise, none so powerful, none with such absolute sovereign rule as him. That he is the king is without doubt. But Isaiah calls him the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace. He is victorious over Satan and he is triumphant over death. He is the king who brings not the spoils of war, but salvation and peace with God. Jesus is not a king who desires human pomp or or human honour and self-glory. He is a humble king, a meek king, a servant king. And he enters Jerusalem on a donkey, which showed this very condescension. Humility and the lowliness spoken there by Zechariah. He is just having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, the colt, a foal of a donkey. It shows his humility, his sweetness, his lowliness, his loveliness. Whereas you see, riding into a city, especially if you're an unknown king, riding into a city on a horse will be a symbol of war. He knew what he was entering the city to face. And he came to bring peace. He came, in a sense, if you like, on the donkey as a white flag. I come in peace. Because entering that city on a horse with people crying out to him being a king would have been seen as presenting the opposite message. I don't come in peace. I'm coming for war. Hence, he enters humbly on a donkey. Isn't it amazing that we read something and when we look at it, we see just how much there is in it. To know, to understand, we can barely put over to us just who he is. See, when Jesus stood before Pilate, he himself confirmed to him that he was a king. You remember? He told Pilate, you say rightly that I am a king. 
For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world. He came to be a king, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18, verse 37. This whole text that we've read, this whole uh, action of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey is just a beautiful picture of who our Lord Jesus Christ is. One of the scriptures that we talk quite a lot about is Romans 5. And in verses 10 and 11, it says this. I mentioned it when I prayed earlier. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we have received the reconciliation. If we've been saved by his death, if we've been reconciled to God by his death, how much more to his life? The Lord proved who he was when he rode that day into Jerusalem on a young donkey. Not only did he show that he is the Messiah King prophesied and expected by the whole Jewish nation for centuries, but he revealed what kind of king he is. He sits on the throne of heaven and he has the earth as his footstool. And yet, and yet, he rides into the city. He was to lay his life down in, not as a human king on his stallion, showing his might and his glory, but on a humble donkey, lowly and meek, making the statement that he comes in peace, that he comes to bring peace. He is embarking on all that was declared by the angels at the time of his birth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And she will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The triumphal entry reveals again the immense love our Lord Jesus Christ has for his people. He didn't ride into Jerusalem for his own sake, but yours and mine. And all who will ever come to him. It was planned before time, before the foundation of the world, and we sit here today in fellowship because he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem that day. Triumphal and victorious it most certainly was. For you, if you are his. Because you are the fruits born of it. Think about it. All those years ago, the very story we're reading in this Bible that we've heard probably every Easter, you're the fruit of it. And he deserves all the honour, all the praise, and all the glory. Father, we thank you for that day that the Lord Jesus Christ picks out a lowly, humble donkey, a young donkey, to ride triumphantly into Jerusalem. And the statements that he made, Lord, that perhaps many times we may have overlooked, but he didn't enter that city as a, as a conquering human king calling out and blowing the trumpet for war, but to bring peace. And Lord, that is what you did. You brought peace between God and man. And we who are here this morning in this place, those of us who are born again, who love Christ, we are fruits born of that day, of all that unfolded after it, all that unfolded before it, and everything that unfolds after it. We are the fruits as the king of kings rose into Jerusalem to lay down his life for his people. Lord, may it be that we rejoice in our souls. And if we're cold, Lord, warm us up, wake us up, I pray, that we might know 
that Christ truly didn't just do this for his people, but he did it for me as an individual. May it be personal, Lord God, to us and not just general. I pray, Lord God, that every person in this room who is yours will know that you went into Jerusalem that day on that donkey, meek and mild and humble, calling out peace and bringing peace to men and dying to save your people, that it was for them personally. And I pray, Lord God, if there are any amongst us unsaved, that they too may be given the revelation of who you are. Give them a hunger and a desire to know you, we pray. Lord, we long for the conversion of sinners amongst us. That can only happen by the power of your Spirit, moving upon the hearts of sinful men and women, piercing them through by the word of the gospel preached. And we pray, O oh God, then, that the word, as you say in your word, will not return to you void. May it do all that it was sent to accomplish, and may that be unto salvation. And Lord, we also know that it will be unto justice too. Father, we give you glory this morning. All these things we present to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.